Hello, and a very warm welcome to this Froebel Trust webinar. My name is Sasha Powell, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Froebel Trust, and I'm your chair for this event in which Jane Reed and Jane Winnett will help us to mark International Women's Day with their fascinating presentation, which is based on their original research about two historical figures who will be introduced to us as Frobelian women opening the door to change. They'll speak for about 40 minutes and then they'll answer your questions. So please, if you have a question, type it into the Q&A box so that we can read it and share it with them. Uh, beginning more than 100 years ago, International Women's Day celebrates the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. And while we celebrate, we're also standing in solidarity. Today, the women of Ukraine are probably foremost in our minds, as well as the children and the men that they love and cherish. But our thoughts are also with all the women experiencing conflict, oppression, pain and suffering and inequality around the world, as well as the women who bravely bring their plight to our attention and help them. In this respect, the power of social media has shown it can be, when used appropriately, a real force for good. If you are a social media user, and you happen to be on Twitter tonight, uh, you can join the conversation about this webinar. And you can do that uh, to connect with others by using a particular hashtag, which is hashtag Frobelian Women with a capital F and a capital W. Um, I am going to be quiet now and switch off my camera and mic, and I'm going to hand over to Jane Reed to begin the presentation. Jane, thank you, and over to you. Thank you very much, Sasha. Uh, thank you, Sasha, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Uh, but um, today, of course, we're, as Sasha said, we're celebrating um, International Women's Day 2022. So as Sasha's pointed out, Jane and I are going to introduce you to two Fabillion women educators who spent the majority of their professional lives over the first decades of the 20th century supporting poor families in London and Edinburgh. And this was a period full of challenges for the working class families in the slums of those cities. I'm going to start with a presentation of about 20 to 25 minutes on Kathleen Stokes' work in Somerstown, the area in London behind King's Cross and St Pancras. And then Jane will speak about Lillian Hardy's work in Edinburgh's Canongate, also for around 20, 25 minutes. Now, I think the first thing to say is that in their work, both Stokes and Hardy were following Froebel's own personal vision of transformation to work for a more equitable and just society, but that they were responding to the different needs of communities in their own time and place. In this context, the doors of their respective nursery schools, which we see here, serve as a metaphor for change, an opportunity for personal and social transformation. Now, our focus is on Stokes and Hardy and how they supported the predominantly white working class families of Summerstown and Canongate. But we recognise that while some of the challenges facing them will find echoes today. But educators in the 21st century will also have different issues to grapple with. And that's because, as we know, the need to transform society is an ongoing project which has to address issues which change over time. Now, for example, we recognise that today our communities are far more diverse and ethnicity is a key factor in young children's experience of poverty. So, Summerstown, just a little bit of context. 
Summerstown Nursery School was located in the North London Borough of Camden, and although by no means the largest of London's borough, boroughs, it was and remains an area of great diversity and inequality, with the wealthy wards of uh, uh, Hampstead and Highgate to the north, and the historically poor wards of Summerstown and St Pancras to the south. So it opened in 1910 at 18 Crowndale Road in Summerstown. It had provision for about 40 children aged two to three to six years. And of course, its aim was to provide a forbidden education for poor children. And it had this rather lovely motto taken from Isaiah, joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. So why open? A, summer, a nursery school in Summerstown. What were the challenges facing the families Kathleen Stokes worked with at the beginning of the 20th century? What we find is that families were experiencing long periods of either unemployment or sporadic employment. And this meant that there was no secure regular income to pay for food, to pay for housing, to pay for health care. However, these structural issues were often ignored and instead working class families were blamed for their incompetence, for their ignorance in bringing up their children. And this was at a time that of the fear that the British race was in physical and moral decline and the eugenics movement was proposing control of reproduction by so-called weak members of society. Now in Summerstown, um, there were support services, but there was no national, there was no welfare state, there was no health service, national health service, there was no comprehensive national insurance system to cover families when illness prevented work. The mother and babies clinics that we have today didn't exist in 1910 and only began to appear from about 1913 to 14, although there was one local exception, which I'll come back to later. And for children, there were no playgrounds, there were no safe spaces for play. Their play spaces were the streets and the gutters. So the intention was um, to nurture the children's bodies as well as their minds and also to provide a moral framework to counteract the perceived effects, ill effects of their upbringing. And also the nursery schools, a further intention of the nursery school was to provide an alternative to the state education provided for young children in infant schools at that time. So Although there were some infant school teachers in London who had taken the Froebel training provided by the London County Council, and Froebel's gifts could be found in some infant schools, as we see in these uh, photos, there is not much evidence to suggest that Froebel's principles were widely understood. And most of the students who attended the Froebel Educational Institute in London went on to teach in private schools and kindergartens. So uh, children were confined in crowded gallery classrooms and learnt largely by vote. And with the Froebel gifts, the focus was on copying the teacher's construction with no room for imagination or creativity. Esther Lawrence, the second principal of Froebel Educational Institute, was the driving force behind the foundation of Summerstown Nursery School. And she had previously opened the Michaelis Free Kindergarten in Notting Hill, London in 1908. And Lawrence's vision was to transform the lives of poor children through providing a Fabian education which would give them opportunities for growth. And that was an optimistic vision. And Lawrence used her position as principal of FEI to encourage students to support her two schools through fundraising and volunteering to help during the school's summer holidays. The nursery school's first mistress in charge was Connie Dent. And she had been a student at uh, FEI um, from 1897 to 1898 
under the college's first principal, Madame Emily Michaelis. But she left after just six months, in all probability because of the demanding nature of the work. Her successor was another FEI student, Kathleen Stokes, who trained under Lawrence from 1907 to 1909 and was associated with Summerstown Nursery School for over 20 years. And like Esther Lawrence and Connie Dent, Stokes was from a middle class family. She was well educated with one of the prestigious girls public day school trust schools before taking her for being training at FEI. And here we see her in this photograph, I've, I've circled her on the end of the row there. And if you just look along the road, road to the middle, you'll see Esther Lawrence there at the centre. Now, researching Stokes' professional life reveals a lifetime of dedication to working with young children, with the vast majority of those years spent at Summerstown Nursery School. But her first experiences were in the children's hospital and then at the Michaelis Free Kindergarten. And that would have given her an idea of the challenges which would face her in Summerstown. Now, in 1919, after eight years at Summerstown, Stokes was forced to resign for reasons not stated, but probably due to ill health. But even so, over the next few years, she continued to support the nursery school as a manager, and helped out on the annual country holiday until her return in 1923. So what were the opportunities that the nursery school gave children, that opening of the door to a different life? Well, as we might expect to see in a Fabinian nursery school, the timetable lists periods of free play, free construction, sorry, free occupations, games, singing, caring for plants and animals, as well as looking after the house and the garden. Now, although the children had opportunities for play and activities in the nursery school garden, and as we see, it had a lovely large climbing frame, it was actually quite small. So the children were taken to Regent's Park and Hampstead Heath with the wide variety of experiences that, that those large open spaces could provide. And there were also special occasions which the children enjoyed. For example, when Queen Mary visited uh, FEI at Roehampton in 1923, 12 of the nursery school children were taken up to Roehampton and we were, were reported to be very good and happy and very proud of having seen the Queen. The children and their mothers also visited Roehampton for the annual Christmas parties, which Esther Lawrence laid on there uh, for the children and the mothers. Now, also, as we see from the timetable, there's, it highlights the concern for the physical care of the children. The nutritious menu featured in more than one annual report and the training in cleanliness was constantly stressed, washing hands and faces toothbrushing and of course the afternoon sleep. So um, <clears throat> reports of the children's activities suggest Stokes had underlying intentions which we might interpret as shaping or moulding these children in different ways of being. I can't read all of these slides out and this a recording will be available for you to come back to in a couple of weeks time. I just wanted to pick out a few of the phrases in these quotes. So, for example, in the first one, they are trained to be useful. And then that last part, when new children are first allowed to wash and clean and polish, they make a great mess. And this order seems to be the order of the day, but gradually give way to cleanliness and order. And the second quote, they are realising the value of claiming this in order and will surely want more and more to have it in their own homes. Things that should be in every home. And then the focus on kind of developing the nurturing qualities 
in these children. The bigger children love taking care of the wee ones. They nearly fight sometimes to get possession of the babies in order to mother them. Even the tiniest of the babies learn to be unselfish and kind to one another through playing with the various toys. And of course, music and singing were part a regular part of the routine in the nursery school. And Fovord highlighted the expressive qualities of music and singing, but Stokes noted that they also had a refining influence. Dinner time, really important point, part of the day. Um, given the poor nutrition the children received at home, the midday meal was key to improving the children's health. But there was more to it than that. It also provided an opportunity to inculcate good manners. The dinner hour still continues to be one of the most valuable times of the day when manners play an important part. It is at this time the children learn that a feeder, not a sleeve, is the right thing to wipe their mouth with. The fingers are not to be put into their plates of soup, etc. A little waiter is chosen for each table every day who is responsible for good behaviour at that table and must see that all are served before sitting down to his or her own dinner. Now, we have to remember that these children lived in cramped tenements and houses, usually in just one or two rooms. At this time, working class families were not yet limiting their family size through birth control. So it would have been impossible for a large family all to sit down together around a table for a meal. Children were likely to eat on the hoof, if you don't mind that expression. In contrast, as we see in these photos, at the nursery school, children would sit at tables. They would be served by other children. There were tablecloths, plates, cutlery, flowers, and the meal was followed by washing up and, of course, toothbrushing. Nature study, outdoor play and care for the children's physical health came together in the summer holidays with long days spent in the country in the open air away from the crowded, polluted London streets. Children would spend up to a month there and the school was fortunate in having its very own holiday home, Summer's Cottage in Sussex. Some of the mothers went with the staff to help look after the children, cleaning the house and cooking, and also FEI students would also sometimes go to help. Now, in the early years of the nursery school, summer holidays with going to the seaside had not yet become part of working class family tradition. Apart from anything else, money was scarce in Somerstown, Somerstown's families for such outings. So we can imagine the reaction of the children to leave in their familiar sur surroundings described by Caroline Lawrence when she looked back in 1931. The children were taken by their mothers to one of the big London stations where they were met by my sister and myself who were responsible for their transit. As the mothers left them shortly before the train started, prolonged screams rent the air. Passengers rushed from their carriages, indignant with the people who must be ill-using these poor little children, who were going to be given such a happy time in the country. Most of the screams were not of long duration. Now, apart from the cottage itself in Sussex, there were outbuildings and nearly four acres of land, including meadows, woodlands, an orchard and a stream, and the experiences the children enjoyed had a lasting effect. I can't see the top of this one. <laughs> uh, right, I can't read the top line of this one, but uh, it's still talked about continually. These joys entered into all the work of the nursery and helped the children for months to retain a breath of the country in their London surroundings. They realized much from that visit. Cows now have horns, wasps have wings and fly, alas, they sting also. Hens sit on eggs, an almost unbelievable thing. Fishes, newts, tadpoles were all met with and greeted as friends. Children and helpers alike returned home full of health and vigour and longing for the next time 
<clears throat> so coming on to now another agenda for the school, they wanted to support the children who had left to move on to the uh, local elementary schools. And of course, at these schools, these uh, nursery school children would inevitably mix with pupils who had not had the benefit of their early education and care. So there was all the potential for those benefits to be lost. And Stokes specifically referred to the longer term aims for these children. The nursery school not only cares for the children while they are under its roof, but seeks to strengthen and train them so that they may be more capable of fighting their own battles later on and of fighting them wisely and well. And to support the past children, Stokes set up an old children's guild, which met weekly. And the children were encouraged. Um, they had uh, wolf cups and brownie packs, and they were encouraged to, to save money through the post office savings bank. They prepared meals for themselves and cleared them away. They did handwork, they played games. And as we can see in this photo, they were also able to pay a visit to the um, holiday home. Now, it was really important that the nursery school work with local services as these young Somerstown children fell into a gap uh, in health provision, the developing health provision. And an nursery school timetable shows that children had a medical inspection at the school and attended the local dental centre, as well as the St Pancras dispensary, which provided free or low cost medical care. Now, a pioneering centre, which the nursery school worked closely with, uh, was the St Pancras School for Mothers in Charlton Street also known, rather less off-puttingly, as Mothers and Babies Welcome. And we know that the children went there as well for dental treatment. Uh, the school also worked with a range of local welfare organisations. For example, the Association for the Mutual Registration of Assistance worked with the nursery schools to identify what were termed families of interest. And children from these families would have priority for their children to attend school. The Public Welfare um, Association granted the nursery school a piece of wasteland for use by the old children's school and the children transformed it into a garden. During and after World War I, when food supplies were short, the school was supp supported by the St Pancras uh, Food Control Office. They helped the school to fill in the necessary request forms and ensured the particular food needed by young children was supplied. Transformation of working class family life, particularly education of mothers in the virtues of cleanliness and care, was a central objective of the nursery school. But even so, this characterisation of family life in Somerstown is remarkably harsh and echoes those contemporary critiques of working class families I referred to earlier. Um, I can see that I'm going to have to move more quickly through, so I won't read that quote. It's there for you to see subsequently. But I do want to uh, note that uh, second quote there from Kathleen Stokes, looking back, the first few children had literally to be picked from the gutter and their mothers persuaded to bring them to the nursery school. Uh, contemporary accounts also describe uh, working class mothers as suspicious, often suspicious of middle class benefactors. Uh, so we can see that uh, coming through in that quote from Stokes. So what strategies did uh, Stokes use to engage the mothers? First of all, Stokes instituted home visits. And you can see there, again, the agenda, the influence of the school are extended with most beneficial effects to the homes. There was also um, the weekly mothers club. So in, to encourage mothers to engage with nursery school, a club was set up and the mothers formed the committee and they managed the club themselves. And this, of course, gave them agency in its activities. And they brought in their mending, they arranged entertainment uh, and, and so on. 
And there were also monthly mothers' meetings and pound and what were called pound days. And at these events, at the meetings and pound days, there were sales of clothes, flowers and fruit. And I rather like this uh, quote here. The clothes were sold cheaply enough to enable the mothers to buy changes of clothes to their children. So we can see there what <laughs> some of the agendas behind this. And then, of course, when it comes to looking at the success of the nursery school, how do we measure it? So the annual report claims that more and more mothers take pains to send their children to school clean and tidy. The mothers are learning to appreciate more and more the training their children receive at the nursery school. One mother said it is not so much the lessons they learn as the nice ways they are taught. That is what has been the making of my children. Now, in 1931, um, Caroline Lawrence, uh, who was the sister of Esther Lawrence and the nursery school's honorary secretary and treasurer, she uh, drew on this uh, description of parts of Somerstown from Charles Booth from his survey of London in 1898, where he described it as little hell. And Lawrence says the whole neighbourhood has improved. And is it not in great part due to the influence of our nursery school? Little Hell, the popular name of one of the streets 21 years ago, now deserves the name of Little Heaven. When it came to the impact on the uh, kind of the educational benefits, we, have, we can't really measure them very much because we don't know the names of the children. We don't know the schools they went to, so we can't track their progress through the schools. But in the annual report from 1913, there was this quote which says the reports of the progress of children who have passed on to the elementary schools are very satisfactory. And then there was another benefit reported by the medical officer for St Pancras in 1923. And he said that the health of children from Somerstown Nursery School and also from a local nursery class was superior on entering the, on, on the uh, local infant schools than ordinary entrants. Now, this is all very well, but, you know, when we're looking at measuring success, whose voices are we actually hearing? The, the words of children and the mothers were always reported almost, almost entirely by nursery school staff and unsurprisingly extolled the good influence of the nursery school. So just again, picking bits out from these quotes, one little girl remarked, another reported. In the second quote, the mothers of former pupils speak gratefully. And then the final quote there, the mothers are learning to appreciate more and more, one mother said. So we don't get, well, there is a little quote there from a mother, but of course, we take it that that's been reported accurately. But we, ve we get very, very little of this reported speech from the mothers or the children. I did find... Uh, this particular example, though, uh, this, these were um, two letters of appreciation um, from two mothers who attended the summer school in 1931. So we do have those, re re you know, uh, reported very directly. But of course, we don't have the names of either the mothers or the names of, of the children. But this is a little bit of evidence of uh, direct evidence from mothers. A couple of assessments of her work for Somerstown. And the first one is interesting because it actually comes from an HMI, uh, an inspector, a school inspector. So you think it's going to be kind of uh, quite, you know, independent, if you like. She's admirably suited for her post. She possesses sympathy and knowledge and remains calm and unruffled under circumstances which would try most people's nerves. And I, I have to say, I, I might wonder what those circumstances might be. The second quote comes from uh, an annual report, and of course that comes from someone within the school uh, talking about uh, Stokes has given the care to the physical and spiritual needs of Somerstown's babies, which has made for happiness in two generations and looked on each child as an individual, giving him just the thought, the personal attention, the training that he especially needs. Uh, just because the gender there is he, of course, the nursery school took in girls as well as boys. 
Right, just to kind of conclude then, my section, poverty and inequality are not just history. Today's Summerstown families have a continuing need for support services, with statistics showing that Summerstown is the most deprived ward in Camden, with roughly 40% of children in St Pancras and Summerstown living in poverty. And to address this, Camden is implementing an £89 million pound Central Summerstown Regeneration Master Plan. But at the same time, Summerstown is squeezed by HS2 developments to the west and the hugely upmarket redevelopment of King's Cross to the east. So, just to finish, today, possibly the greatest threat to Summerstown's rich, ethnically diverse community is the creeping gentrification of the area and a prospect of this historically poor but always vibrant community being pushed out. Thank you for my, your my attention. Thank you for your attention. I must end here and pass over to Jane, but if any of you have any questions about Summerstown today, we can come back to, to that in our final Q&A. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jane Reed and Jane Quinnett. We're going to pass immediately over to you uh, okay. to talk about Lillian Hardy's work in Edinburgh. Thank you very much, Sasha, and thank you, Jane. It just makes me aware of um, how many similarities there were between the work in London and the work in Edinburgh, and also makes me very aware of some of the things that I've left out. So for International Women's Day, I'd like to celebrate um, Lillian Hardy and her work at St Saviour's Child Garden. Jane Reedon introduced me to St Saviour's Kindergarten and Lillian Hardy during the Frobel Certificate course at the University of Roehampton in 2005. As part of my reflective account, I read the diary of a free kindergarten and the words, it takes me to do it, doesn't it, no, stopped me in my tracks. Here was a Scottish child expressing Frobel's ideas of self-activity. I was hooked and I wanted to know more. I contacted St Paul's Episcopal Church and met their archivist, Peder Aspen. He shared some images and information. I mentioned my interest to, uh, to two nursery head teacher colleagues, uh, Judy Goodyear and Kitty Renton. And Kitty arranged a meeting for me with a friend's mother who had attended the kindergarten when she was three years old. Dolly was 93 when I interviewed her and you'll see some of her recollections here. The second quote on that first slide there, um, worms um, cause, <laughs> cause tremendous excitement, have a real personal memory for me too because I trained in Kent and um, the children used to all fall about laughing when I said um, worms. So it, it was a, a sort of reverse, a reverse humour here. So Lillian Hardy was a remarkable woman. She was born in Alderbury in 1872 the daughter of a pharmacist with at least three sisters and a brother. And as Elizabeth Darling reports, her family was sufficiently affluent for a mother's help and a general servant to pay for her and, and a general servant and to pay for her training based on the approach um, developed at the Pestalozzi Frobel House in Berlin, uh, but now delivered at the Sesame House in London. This was essentially a revisionist rebellion approach with a focus on health and Froebel's principles, not, nece not necessarily linked to Froebel's original practice. Jane White from Charlotte Squale in, in Edinburgh was on the board of management as this report shows. And, um, and by 1901, Hardy was the kindergarten teacher and governess for the White family in Charlotte Square. Elizabeth Darling suggests it's likely that it was through her that Lillian Hardy came to know the old town as a site for women's philanthropic activism. Hardy was already involved in the first free kindergarten in the old town. Poverty in the Cannon Gate was widespread and this painting from 1860 shows characters from the Royal Mile, including a fishwife. Fishwives walk from New Haven with their creels to sell their fish in the Cannon Gate. Fish was the cheapest form of meat. It's significant that Carl Froebel, who was resident in Edinburgh in 1875, 
mentions fish tales in his graphic description of the gutter play of children living in the slums. Fish were gutted as they were bought on the doorsteps of the tenements. So it's very likely in a poor area, there'd be a lot of fish bones lying around. The infant mortality rates in the Canongate were high in comparison with other, other areas of the city. The density of the population living in poor, overcrowded accommodation exacerbated the spread of infection and disease. Many families lived in, in what were known as single ends, a room with a range fire to cook on, a box bed and other beds that could be wheeled out from below. 1861 census showed that 226,000 families in Scotland lived in one room houses. 71% of Scottish homes had two rooms or less and housed 64% of the population. The tenements were divided and subdivided. And then in Edinburgh, there could be as many as 15 people living in one room, um, an average of five people live in a room um, with very little access to uh, fresh water or toilets. So Knox um, reports the most common causes of death in Scotland as diseases of the brain and nervous system, diseases of the respiratory system, diseases of the heart, diseases of the digestive organs and epidemic and contagious um, diseases. So looking at a map of the Cannon Gate um, around the area where um, St Saviour's was, we can see the proliferation of breweries uh, where many of the fathers would have been in work. There were references to the impact of alcohol on family life in the diary, including a description of a child playing drunk. Um, reform of the housing conditions was a priority for the City Council and Darling asserts that although Patrick Geddes and Henry Littlejohn were credited with the radical change in the area through conservative surgery and health initiatives, it was the work of women who actually changed the lived experiences of children and families on the ground. Geddes's work on green spaces, knocking down buildings in the worst conditions and regenerating housing stock with a radical policy of rich and poor living alongside each other. Geddes and his family lived among the other inhabitants of the Royal Mile. Hilton and Hirsch described the women who made these changes happen as practical visionaries. And according to Kevin Brioni, the notion that poverty was a structural condition related to casual labour, unemployment and the downturns in economic cycles endemic to capitalism was not one that the free kindergartens were familiar with. Environmental explanation is true did sometimes appear as when Leleen Hardy wrote of the mothers of the children who attended her kindergarten, that with the cramped house space, burdened restricted lives and big families, it's hardly to be expected that they will have energy, insight, time and patience to train their children. This empathy with the poor was unusual. So the annual reports of St Saviour's Children Gard Gardens show um, the title, A Contribution to the Slum Problem in Edinburgh. Um, and Jane Reed speaks about the relocating the play from the gutter into the kindergarten because um, children were perceived to be at risk and also a risk. So Old St Paul's Church already had a settlement and dispensary and the uh, kindergarten opened in November um, 1906 and moved to Chessel's Court in 1908. Conditions of the Cannon Gate are described in the handwritten and hand produced illustrated pamphlet shown here. There was a constant search for funding to continue the work. Kristen Narotsky um, describes how hard he borrowed Wiggins' um, successful funding strategy, calling it artistic fictions. Information suggests that Lillian Hardy proposed the kindergarten to Canon Laurie, the rector of St Paul's. Old St Paul's um, already had this dispensary and settlement and Lillian Hardy originally funded the kindergarten from her own savings 
for the first three years, as well as from sub sub some subscriptions. Subscribers were listed in the annual reports. In later reports, there were specific thanks to individuals for gifts. Laleen Hardy was resourceful. Garden parties were held to encourage subscriptions. The annual reports include flyers to make a subscription or to buy a copy of the diary of a free kindergarten and later to leave a legacy. Legacies made a considerable contribution to funding. It's inter interesting to note that Mrs Somerville from Collington subscribed. She advocated and supported infant playgrounds in Edinburgh and is listed as a subscriber in the annual reports of Hope Cottage Nursery as well. Mrs Somerville became a councillor in Bailey with Edinburgh Council. Dorothy Gardner spoke about um, the salaries um, of, of um, herself and uh, Louine Hardy. A salary of only £150 per year, which with the cost of living in Edinburgh was fairly hard going for a young teacher like me. But for Miss Hardy herself, who I feel sure had for many years refused to receive more, amounted to evidence of real heroism on her part. The annual account in 1910 uh, uh, showed a starting salary of £100 with a deduction of £25 for rent and gas. So what was um, Laleen Hardy's vision for the children and the future? She said, we want to send out individuals able to think, to cope with the situation, to be resourceful, to be good social beings with real knowledge and imagination. Um, an aim that clearly chimes with Froebel's aim to cause children to think. Their nursery is the street and what they have there, and though it may develop their wits, too often it does so at the expense of their finer qualities. Their imagination may be stimulated, but it's an undesirable direction and not beautifully as a child's imagination should be stimulated. So the next session uh, uh, focuses on the garden, a, frial, a, a key Frobelian context um, for learning. Um, and I want to start with um, an echo of the children's voices. So this is Dolly here. I remember playing a lot in the garden. We played a lot down there in that first garden. I think the first garden had all the flowers. I remember the lower one never had much and we used to cut the hedge. We, we had ordinary scissors and you just had to cut what you could with it because they wouldn't give you big ones. We used to sew and make things. You never did nothing. At this point, I started to feel like a researcher, uh, finding different um, sources that either illum illuminated or uh, confirmed uh, my uh, first uh, findings. So um, Laleen Hardy wrote to Patrick Geddes and, you know, always follow up with a letter uh, to return his notes and to take the opportunity to remind him of her wish list. It's ambitious. Dear Patrick Geddes, I return your notes with very many thanks for your most valuable suggestions. I have not thought of anything else I want beside the swing, seesaw, sand heap, bank to roll down, toboggan slide, <laughs> red ash playground, small pond, vegetable garden, long run, pigeon house, fowl run. Um, Helen Tovey would have been proud of her, but I feel I ought not to take your time for another minute, for I'm afraid the funds will never run to a quarter of all these delightful things. Thanking you very heartily for the help you have been. Yours very sincerely, Laleen W. Hardy. And these little sketches at the side um, uh, are the uh, garden and you can see his different plans, the possible plans for the garden and actually the names of the, um, you know, the plants to be planted around the edge. Um, in that one at the top left, you can see the actual vegetable plot uh, with the, with the uh, vegetables writ written in it. So um, the one thing that um, I really, uh, really uh, excited me was um, the, the pigeon house. Um, so the pigeon house um, here uh, was, um, you, there's Patrick Geddes's sketch of the pigeon house. Uh, and um, this was on Hardy's list. Um, 
And this is significant to me because it links right back to Froebel's mother song, The Pigeon House. Um, and uh, the photograph of St Saviour's at the bottom there um, uh, shows that um, Hardy's wish um, came to fruition. So uh, the evidence in the original uh, handwriting excerpts uh, shows the interest and responsibility that the children took in the garden and the plants uh, growing there, as this page shows. Um, and I'll just read this little bit off the, off the page. I warned her, Peggy, you might fall, and if you did, you would hurt yourself very badly. And Ina added in a, in a tone of uh, much greater importance, and you would break the crocuses. And Dolly remembers, they had three gardens at the back. There were three levels. At the top was grass and flowers, and I always remember that the grass was square like that. In this cordon, the corner, there was a stone. It wasn't much bigger than up to there, and that was my garden. It used to annoy me, you know, the boys ran around chasing each other, and they used to jump over my garden. I used to get quite annoyed with that. This description from the annual report shows Froebel's ideas in action communal gardens for sharing with the community, as well as the responsibility of their own little plot. And this is corroborated by uh, Dolly's indignation at the boy's behaviour towards her plot. Great use is made of the garden. Uh, the many hours of hard labour which the fathers gave last year in laying out the new terrace have been well repaid. The vegetable plots bore a crop, part of which was proudly carried home and distributed by the little gardeners, even to the grandmothers and aunts. Cabbages, parsley, turnips, carrots and potatoes were gathered up by the respective growers, cleaned, cut up and made into broth, which regaled the whole school, all declaring, of course, that there was never such broth. The children completed the laying out of the playground by them themselves, fetching a gift of several cartloads of ash from the neighbouring brewery. Tina Bruce sees the garden and the landscape beyond, not as an isolated self haven, um, but places that cause thought. And this is because they're engaged in ways that results in actions towards making a better world and encouraging children to see themselves, others and the universe. Canon Laurie um, from Old St Paul's uh, came on Wednesdays and conducted the assembly. He gave the children an informal talk and had a very lively game in the garden with them afterwards and they enjoyed his visits. So Dolly remembers this and she says, Canon Laurie used to come on Wednesday. He did the service and then he would play with us down at the very bottom. Who's afraid of Black Peter, he used to say, and we all used to run and whoever got caught joined him for Black Peter. I mind he used to come on a Wednesday and, be, and the photograph here um, seems to show that game uh, with the children and uh, Can and Laurie running round. So a few insights into Lillian Lean Hardy's character. Like all pioneers there were times when she was not easy to work with but one could not fail to re feel respect for her devotion. Um, and the genuine concern for the children's welfare and the disregard of her own comfort and popularity. And Dolly says, I do remember when we used to have um, a special day or a party or something, Miss Hardy, who was the head teacher, she stood by the door and we had to say, thank you, Miss Hardy, for having our tea and goodbye. We seemed not to have any bother there. It was quite nice. They were real ladies, they were. So um, similar to Jane's um, about the medical inspections and, you know, the not noting of, um, you know, nutrition, which was slightly better and rickets, which were slightly better than the year before, being a marked improvement in the eyesight and the lungs, putting all this down to good food, well-directed exercise, restful sleep and attention. Um, and this being 1919, um, there was a, you know, a decline in the clothing and foot gear and also um, in teeth. And perhaps that was because a lot of the fathers were away at war and um, a lot of the mothers were working. 
So um, 21 children were taken by the kindergarten staff to the dental hospital for treatment. But several had already were already considered hopeless. We're now instituting a toothbrush drill at the school. And of course, um, dental decay in Scotland is still a concern. Um, and really the Child Smile initiative um, you know, came in to um, try to um, have an impact on that, which it did have. Uh, but most recent uh, research um, during uh, you know, the impact on children of COVID, um, you know, is raising concerns about children's um, dental health. Also, infection control is no new thing. Um, here's a page from the original uh, photo album. It's, uh, it's called This is the Way We Wash Our Hands. Um, and we can see here too that, you know, it talks about the every room is thoroughly sprayed with disinfectant twice daily and Nurse Thistle inspects each day every morning. So I feel like there's nothing new um, under the sun. Just a quick look at data from the um, uh, Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. We see that Cannon Gate continues to be an area where the domain uh, of deprivation in housing, crime rate and education skills score poorly, in spite of the fact that we've got Scottish Parliament right at the bottom of the hill. Um, so the Old Count Community Report um, tells us also about the occupation of um, the and, and accommodation there. In contrast to Lillian Hardy's day, single occupancy now tends to be with students. Um, we see that there continues to be, um, you know, uh, a high number of children with um, free uh, school meals. Um, a significant difference in, um, in the number of ethnic minority children um, living in the area um, and a considerable number of children with additional support needs. So quick note about what um, Scottish Government is um, does to help um, nowadays, um, looking at the kinds of um, universal offers that are made uh, for young children um, and their families. Um, and there continues to be, um, um, you know, community support within the Cannon Gate um, area from uh, the cranny. So go back to Miss Hardy. Um, we know that her health was um, failing, um, that she um, retired in 1927. She still took a very keen interest in what was happening in um, the kindergarten. Uh, for years afterwards. Um, this is a postcard that she sent um, from um, when she was on abroad. She was keen to keep in touch with families that she'd worked with. I send with this with many good wishes to all the family. I was delighted to hear of little Annie's son. Please tell Lizzie that her promised letter has never reached me. I send you this photo so you shan't forget me. Perhaps she would be astonished to know that after 110 years, and that she's far from, from, from forgotten. There are students every year on the Froebel and childhood practice at the University of Edinburgh who hear about her work and she's held in very high esteem. There's a lovely memorial in um, the annual report um, and she um, left a legacy herself um, to, uh, to uh, the, the kindergarten. Her final legacy, of course, was not in the amount that she left in her will, but the doors that she opened for the children and families that she worked with as a pioneer of a Frobelian approach to early learning and childcare. Um, and we can see here um, both a bit about the Original Education Act, but also um, just finish with what um, the free kindergartners did was to illustrate, along with many others, the necessity for state action to ameliorate the lot, the lot of the slum child. They also managed to install at the heart of early years education the notion that its concern for the whole child was not just its cognitive abilities. And of course, there are still Rebellion women in the old town um, still doing uh, fantastic work, uh, particularly my colleague, uh, Dr Lynn McNair, head of Cowgate under fives. So many thanks to all the archivists and um, people who helped me uh, to find, to put these together. <laughs> Sorry, it was a bit of a rush at the end. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Jane. And, and thank you for putting up um, both the details of the archives and the archivists who helped you, because that was one of my questions. Um, but also for sharing um, your um, uh, references at the end, which I know will be incredibly helpful to everyone. I don't know if Jane Reed, are you there? Do you want to, to come back and join us? Put your video. Uh, there she is. Hello. Oh, I, I've been paying a great deal of attention to everything that's been going on. Thank you both okay. very much. There were there were lots of um, parallels, echoes uh, with the past when we think about today. There are so many connections, aren't there, really? And it was wonderful to hear about these two women who, uh, uh, as you said just now, Jane, were really pioneering um, the role of those uh, women working in early years who are drawing attention to the need for state support for the kind of welfare state approach to early childhood education for all children, all young children. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that to our attention, along with the many other fascinating facts that you've shared with us. Those, if I may. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you to Rianne Ferguson. Rianne has asked whether um, the staff who weren't teachers, in inverted commas, had to have some kind of qualification or experience to be able to work with the children in those days, or whether that was not a particular requirement. I think there was both um, at St. <laughs> There was some um, some people who definitely had trained, um, and others who were volunteers um, from a local. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, so both. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. About I, I would say the same at Sonstown. Um, certainly, um, in one of the annual reports, the assistant is listed as a, a trained kindergarten teacher, uh, and they also had students who went in to help there as well, both from Fogel, but from other training colleges as well. But on the whole, um, there's not a lot of information. I mean, sometimes the name of the assistant is given, but nothing else. But as I say, in a couple of instances, they are referred to as, as trained kindergarten teachers. And of course, Kathleen Stokes was a Fogel trained teacher, as was mm. Connie Dent. Mm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, to dive in quickly with another question because we are short of time. Um, we have actually two questions from Elizabeth Darling. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your questions. Uh, she says, first of all, thank you for your fascinating papers. And um, she asks, if you know, uh, Jane, what dates Dolly attended SSCG? I don't know off the top of my head. I might be able to work it out she, um, because she was um, she was one of the early ones, um, and she stayed until she was, um, I think, seven or eight. Um, so I would I should be able to work that out. Um, okay, and, and be able to email you, um, you Elizabeth. Thank yeah. you very much. Well, I'll move on to Elizabeth's second question, which is um, whether um, Kathleen Stokes had connections with or was consulted by the women involved in the St Pancras House Improvement Society around, uh, founded in 1919, which built housing oh, yeah. that incorporated a nursery school on one of the blocks. Yes, that was St Christopher's Rooftop Nursery that opened about 1931. And I think that's a, I, I did see that question come up, Elizabeth. It's a very good question because actually I'm involved in... Um, the People's Museum project in Somerstown. So uh, it's absolutely fascinating because the annual reports make absolutely no reference to the that re, uh, the kind of social housing that was being built in in Somerstown in the twenties and thirties. None whatsoever, and that really surprised me. <laughs> Somerstown was there. She's going Crown Down Road, was slightly to the north, but even so, it given that they work with the uh, uh, pack, the Mothers and Babies Welcoming Chowton Street, which is right by uh, the kind of new housing that was being put up there. Um, it, it's, it's actually uh, amazing that I, I haven't, there's no reference to it in the annual reports. And of course, that is the only records that I've come across about the nursery school so far, which is what I've drawn on most substantially for this research. Fascinating question. And I will renew my efforts 
uh, and ask some of my colleagues who were involved in that uh, Summers Town People's Museum project. Sounds great, thank you. And, and perhaps we can share a link to that project on the Frobel Trust website to give a little bit more yes, information. Right. Yes, I will, yeah. Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time. I'm just going to try and squeeze in uh, one more question, which I think is quite a hard one. Do you think the children had richer experiences then compared to now? It's a bit difficult because <laughs> there's such a diversity of children's experiences now. <laughs> um, and then I think there was a huge emphasis on um, um, health, um, which there continues to be, but um, do you know there there was no um, shared um, curriculum, if you like, um, then or um, so it, it's difficult to compare. I think mm, absolutely, absolutely. I think, what, I think what I would say in response to that is that. Generally, children's experiences today are richer. I know there are still children living in great deprivation, but there are more facilities for them. There are playgrounds for them uh, and other, uh, other facilities for children today. And in terms of the Summerstown children, the experiences they had in the nursery school, in, in being taken to Hampstead Heath and, and Regent's Park, in going, being taken to the countryside and the seaside, I, I think, if you look at it in that way, they did have richer experiences because the rest of their life, they didn't really have anything that children today tend to have. Mm, thank you. Um, there are more questions and I'm sorry we've not had time to go through them. So uh, we will make sure that they're passed on to you. Uh, we had one from Feng Ling Tang, one from Debbie Hunter. I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to answer those. I, I um, did see Debbie's and Debbie, I will get oh, back to you about that. <laughs> OK, that's great. Thank you. Um, well, Jane, Jane, thank you both for an absolutely wonderfully fascinating historical presentation. I think it's been a great celebration for International Women's Day. Um, if this has whetted your appetite and you want to know about more Frobelian women, there is this wonderful book, um, which Jane Reed has edited with Amy Palmer. And um, you should have received the details of a 20% discount code if you'd like to buy that book or borrow it from a library, get it on interlibrary loan. I encourage you to read that. And if you're able to join us at any of our subsequent webinars, that would be lovely to see you. So I just wish you all um, a very happy and safe International Women's Day. And thank you very much for joining us tonight. And we hope you have a good rest of the day or evening. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye.